Good evening. I am Jack Fuji, and welcome to the eighth session of Agriculture 194R, Focus on Agriculture. Agriculture 194R is a one-credit course offered by the College of Agriculture, Forestry, and Natural Resource Management at the University of Hawaii at Hilo. And we come to you live from the television studios located in the Mo'okini Library on the University of Hawaii at Hilo campus. This evening, uh, we will be talking about the impact of marine aquarium fish and the tourist industry uh, on our reefs. So we hope that you'll stay tuned uh, to our Agriculture 194R class this evening. For those of you joining us for the first time, Agriculture 194 is a uh, class offered by the College of Agriculture to inform you about the various aspects of diversified agriculture. And each semester, we focus on a different subject area of diversified agriculture. And this semester, we're focusing on conservation biology and natural resource management here in, the, uh, here in Hawaii. Uh, uh, reflecting the name change of our college, uh, the College of Agriculture, Forestry, and Natural Resource Management here at the University of Hawaii at Hilo. Before I go on, I'd like to, uh, well, what happened to it? Well, it's okay. Uh, we'll, we'll just go on. Since we're coming to you live this evening at approximately 8 p.m., those of you in the viewing audience, and of course, those of you here in the studio can ask questions of our guest speaker. And of course, those of you here on the Big Island can call us direct, and we will have a collect call uh, on the screen at approximately 8 p.m. And those of you on the outer islands of uh, Maui, uh, Oahu, Kauai, Molokai, Lanai, uh, watching us on the cable uh, channel can call in and ask questions. <clears throat> So we hope that uh, you don't change the channel uh, this evening. My guest speaker is Dr. Bill Walsh. Dr. Walsh uh, received his uh, doctorate degree from the University of Hawaii at Manoa. He uh, majored in zoology and uh, he studied the uh, uh, behavior and ecology of uh, uh, marine fish. And he also received his uh, bachelor of science degree in uh, biology from state uh, State University in New York. And he's been with uh, the Department of uh, DLNR for approximately one year. And I'm glad to hear that he's a true agriculturist. He has a tropical fruit farm in uh, South Kona. So at this time, it gives me a great pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Walsh. So Bill, why don't you come over here and take over the class? Thank you, Jack. Aloha. It's a pleasure to be here. As uh, Dr. Fujii said, my focus tonight is going to be on basically two aspects, uh, tropical aquarium reef fish collecting and tourism and how that uh, impacts the reefs. Timely subject because front page news today in the advertiser, damage to isles coral assessed. So you can see in this picture here is a giant anchor sitting on the reef. Um, state of the art. May I have the first slide, please? This is where we are, the most isolated group of islands on the planet. Okay, it's over 2,500 miles to the nearest continental landmass and about 1,000 miles to the nearest coral reef area, which is down in the line, line islands. The reefs, which are particularly uh, outstanding in the, in the Hawaiian Islands, constitute over 85% of all coral reefs under United States jurisdiction. And that includes areas Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands, and then coming out into the Pacific, areas like Guam, uh, Northern Marianas Islands, American Samoa. So Hawaii has the bulk of America's coral reefs. And the Division of Land and Natural Resources, the Department of Aquatic, or the Division of Aquatic Resources, whom I work for, has the management responsibility for all of the reefs within three miles. So the Leeward Islands aren't really included in, in our Kuleana, but in all the high islands and the coral reefs are what we're basically involved in managing. Now, 
probably one of the most unique aspects about our Hawaiian reefs are the numbers of animals that are found nowhere else in the world. So there's approximately 5,000 species that we know about so far on our reefs, and at least a quarter of them on the average are endemic. So they're found nowhere else in the world, 25%. And that includes fish and mollusks and, and corals and so forth and so on. I am not advancing. I have the next slide, please. That's not the next slide. Okay, here we go. Ah, I've got control. Okay. The first aspect of uh, management that I want to talk about is the interaction between the tourist industry and our reefs. Now, what you're seeing in the slide here is a throw net fisherman looking off the reef, and in the distance is a large tour boat. It used to be called the Spirit of uh, Adventure. Uh, local residents called it the Spirit of Noise because it used to sit and just run its generators all the time. Tourism is Hawaii's largest industry by far, um, and the marine sector of that is one of the strongest parts of the tourism industry. The revenue generated is probably in excess of $800 million, and there's about 1,000 small businesses involved with tourism. So it has ramifications that extend way beyond just the dollars and cents, because particularly with regard to this sector, the marine environment, uh, as you'll see, there can be a number of impacts that uh, can be both uh, acute and chronic. So this is a shot of Kealakekua Bay, typical tour boat with snorkelers, uh, in this case, you know, just swimming around. And one of the things that's come up in, in recent discussions and in concern is, well, what impact are snorkelers having? You know, people think, well, you know, they're floating around, they're not doing much damage. But the more and more we look at things, uh, what we see are in areas where there is heavy use, okay? We're not talking about remote areas, but particularly where play people go repeatedly, you can end up with problems. So this is a shot over West Hawaii. This is Ka'ulu Beach Park, popular snorkeling area. It's a relatively shallow reef, and like a mini Hanama Bay, lots of people enter the water there, lots of people walking around when they should be snorkeling, standing on coral heads like this one, and what it results in, it's not an innocuous thing just standing on the coral head, you start abrading the actual living polyps of the coral, crushing them, scraping them off, both by the fins and, you know, if they have booties or whatever on. And it's like a, an abrasion or a wound in humans. It, it makes them, the corals more susceptible to infection, not to mention just, the, you know, the physical destruction. So here's another shot. You can see this nice coral head. And the, the whole top section where the guy's uh, duck fins are on there, it's just totally eroded. So in an area like Kaolu, you have a lot of people, long term, you end up with lots of dead coral. Okay. And of course, you all have heard of Hanama Bay, yeah? Well, Hanama Bay has taken this impact from, from tourism to the extreme. It's in some people's mind, it's like you know, looking ahead in the future where people are all over the place. Now, this shot is atypical because it's taken about 8 o'clock in the morning and it was shot 14 years ago. If you go out, 10 o'clock in the morning, there's people clamoring all around on the reef out there. Uh, so again, if the key to this kind of impact, broken coral, abraded coral, is usually the lack of education. The people don't quite understand that they shouldn't be you know, walking around on the reef, and just the fact that there are so many people doing it. And uh, West Hawaii is, in many cases, in some areas, you know, a mini Hanama Bay. Uh, a lot of what I say will be based on West Hawaii, Kona and, and Kohala, but it's almost totally applicable to elsewhere, uh, certainly East Hawaii, anywhere uh, there's coral reefs and people and people using them. This is a shot um, of Kealakekua Bay and one of the first attempts to actually get a scientific handle on, well, what, you know, what kind of effect are snorkelers having, particularly snorkelers. And this was done by you folks, or at least 
your mentors, your professors, uh, two of them, uh, Dr. Leon Holliker and Dr. Brian Tussaud, uh, both UHH professors, and they were working with DAR. So they went to an area that they knew had a lot of tourism, and they set up what they would con call control sites, which were areas that were in the same environment but had a lot fewer people, and then they would look at their experimental sites, in this case, you know, was tourist boats were just dumping the people. They went out, would count broken coral heads, abrasions on corals, trying to get you know, a quantitative feel for what kind of impact uh, snorkelers could have. And their study has just been finished, and kind of the cut to the chase on the study, they found no significant differences between areas that had lots of snorkelers and areas that had relatively few snorkelers. So you might say, well, OK, what does that say? But what they did find was that there was a difference. It just was not significant at this point. This was a two-year study. So this graph, if you look at the, the high bars, you can see those are the areas that had higher numbers of snorkelers. And then the lower bars are the ones that had fewer. Statistically, there's no difference. So you know, a scientist would say, well, there's probably a chance that what you're seeing is only due to chance. They interpreted it as saying, OK, there, there is a slight difference. And what can happen now, if this slight difference gets increased by a slight amount every year, you know, after you have tourism in the same place for 15, 20 years, you can end up with totally degraded reefs. So even though the damage in a short time is small, given a number of years, that damage can become major. So at least in this study, and it's one of the few studies that have looked at the impact of, of tourism, um, some indication of you've got to be careful. And it's intuitive. You know, it doesn't take a scientist to, to really make that clear. Well, it's not only snorkelers that are a problem in terms of coral reefs. Uh, divers, in particular <laughs> this diver, can often be a problem. Now, maybe even more so because they operate in water that's typically deeper than where snorkelers go. They have the ability to go down on the bottom to clown around, rest on the coral. And the corals that are found in deeper water, because the water tends to be more protected, tend to be more fragile kinds of things, making them even more vulnerable to the effect of uh, you know, divers. So in this case, this diver actually, you could turn this around and say, this is a good example of a diver being able to go underwater and not cause any damage. And the key in this case is because this diver knows how to maintain neutral buoyancy. So you're essentially totally weightless underwater. And that's a function of how much weight you have, how much air you have in your BC, and it's a function of experience. But when you're good at it, you're essentially weightless. So you could put yourself down on a coral head like this, and it's like essentially no weight on that coral head, so it doesn't break. However, uh, that takes time, it takes practice, it takes skill. New divers don't have the ability, and you get somebody on there who doesn't know it, and kaboom, you know, those fragile coral heads are broken. Photography. Again, uh, photographers are after the shot. You know, they got to get that picture. And Sometimes that's all they're interested in is getting the picture. So you'll see them clambering around and smashing coral heads. And even though they're, they're verbalizing and saying, you know, we're out there to capture the beauty of the reef and, you know, that's most interested to protect it, just by, you know, virtual the pursuit without uh, considering what they're doing uh, can cause uh, much damage. This particular diver is a good example of what you should be doing. Because what she has done is, if you see behind her, it's a big sand area. So she's come up to this coral head. It's a nice little fragile coral head. And she's trying to shoot a small crab or something on it. But rather than kind of leaning on the coral head itself, she's kneeling in the sand and approaching off of the coral head. So she's really not touching the coral itself. Uh, again, a function of education, experience, uh, and, and those things. So you don't necessarily uh, have to be causing damage when you're underwater. This is another good example of what you should be doing underwater. These are National Geographic cinematographers that were working, uh, shooting a film. And I don't know if you can make it out too well. But they set up their camera, and they stationed themselves in this beautiful reef area. But actually, where they're standing, it's just barren bottom. Okay, There's no coral growing in that. So they, you know, they went around, and they looked, and they made an effort to set up and to stay in that area because they knew they're going to be moving around and not paying attention to what they're doing because they're looking through that viewfinder. So they made a conscious effort 
to protect the reef. And again, you know, hammering home this thing about once you understand what you should be doing, there's really no excuse for not doing it. And education is, is the key to it all. So moving beyond just physical insults to the reef by you know, breaking corals and things, another one that's come up and has drawn concern from a number of people is the habit of feeding fish. We're not talking about feeding fish when you're fishing for them, but just you know, taking food out and trying to attract the fish all around you uh, for whatever reason, to get closer to them. And this is a diver feeding uh, millet seed butterfly fish, and they're swarming all around and such. So you know, people say, well, what's the big deal? In fact, a lot of tourism, a lot of tourist operations feed the fish so that they can get them close to the people who you know, are coming out there. And big experience of how many people have been to Hanama Bay where the fish just kind of you know, rush up on you. Again, a large portion of that activity of them coming up is because they're expecting food. People have been doing it there for years and years. And we're talking about, you know, I'm talking about high quality fish food. We're talking about anything from hot dogs to popcorn to you know, peas and all kinds of literally crap. Well, what's the problem with fish feeding? Um, tourist people say that all the time. What's the problem? You know, we're, it's good. People like it. Well, the problem is, one, that when you do it repeatedly in an area, you start to change the types of fish that are there. Because what you're getting then, you're getting the, the sort of the piggy fish, the hog fish, the ones that are aggressive feeders, the ones that will come in and zoom in and take stuff, all kinds of stuff that they wouldn't normally eat, but they'll take it. And given enough time, they learn that these areas are, are a source of, of quick grub, and they begin to dominate. So in this slide, there's two of the culprits, and I, culprits probably isn't the correct word, but nevertheless, two of the individuals, two species, that tend to dominate areas where there's a lot of fish feeding going on. That's Nainui in the background, and the one with the white uh, tail is uh, Palani, a big surgeon fish. Okay, and both these guys, and they're, they get very large. And what happens is when you feed the fish, you know, these, it's like a little feeding frenzy. These guys are swarming all around. And a lot of the other fish, the butterfly fish, and fish that are maybe not interested in what you're feeding them, physically, they're uncomfortable because there's a swarm of large fish creating this uh, frenzy. So they learn to avoid these areas. And you end up with a totally unnatural fish community that's sort of dominated by species like these two. And another one is the uh, hagi, or the humuhumu ele ele, uh, and it's not that you know, there's anything bad about the, these species. They're, you know, they're great. But when they come and they're just, the numbers of them just obliterate uh, the presence of other species, then, you know, then it becomes sort of an unnatural experience and uh, getting further and further away from maybe what people really went out on the reef to see to begin with. And then there's another concern, too, about feeding fish. Some of what they, uh, people feed them are way beyond the kinds of things that they would be eating normally. And fish tend to lack amylase, which is a, a, an enzyme that breaks down starch. So if you're feeding them bread, for example, they may be chowing down on this bread and actually being stuffed, but they're deriving basically no nutritional value out of the bread. And so they're eating, but they're getting you know, false calories, so to speak. They're not being able to assimilate that. So you may actually be doing some harm to the, to the species themselves. Uh, degrading their, uh, their condition and so forth. So the, the feeling is now among biologists that fish feeding should be discouraged. We're not again, let me mention, you know, we're not talking about fishing. So you, know, you can go out and chum. That's a different story. And in fact, Hanama Bay is the first uh, marine life conservation district in the state that has put feeding off limits. And we'll also have that uh, in quite a number of areas over in West Hawaii, and no doubt will spread here. I don't know how much of a problem it is here. But in probably all respects, getting back to just physical damage, anchoring has to, to rank high on the list. Uh, it's, again, something in comparison to fish feeding. If you stop, the effects go away pretty quickly. Not the case with anchoring. You drop anchors in the areas, coral's broken. You repeatedly anchor in the area, and you end up with uh, a dust bowl almost, you know, just total decimation. And this is a fairly large anchor. But even small anchors, if the boat moves, drags them through the coral, rips them apart, and so forth. And boats tend to anchor in deeper water. And deeper water has some of the most spectacular corals. And also, again, has you know, those fragile corals. So these are some nice corals taken off of City of Refuge. You, know, you drop an anchor in this thing, and bang, uh, it, it's smattered. 
And some of these coral heads, this is another type of coral, uh, lobe coral, you know, they can be hundreds of years old. So you know, just a careless act and you can destroy hundreds of years worth of growth. And it may literally take hundreds of years for that coral head you know, or something like that to come back and grow in that same area. So literally a moment's uh, inconsideration can cause uh, generations worth of, of damage. So here is an anchor chain. So it's not necessarily just the anchor sitting on the bottom, but big boats have a big chain to keep the anchor you know, set. So you drop the anchor, bang, chain goes down, bang, 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 and all those white spots you see on the coral and the finger coral are all recently broken pieces of coral. Now, if there's any kind of swell, the boat's going to be moving, the anchor's going to be moving, or maybe not the anchor moving, but that chain on the anchor is going to be swinging back and forth, and literally in a matter of an hour or so, you can just create this whole big swath of destruction uh, on the reef where prior to that was uh, beautiful coral. Solution is easy. One, don't, if you're out on a boat, don't anchor on live coral. You know, take that extra effort and look. You can look down in the water and see. Look for sand patches or get off in deeper water. Look for barren areas. Or in cases you know, of larger boats that are going back to areas that are full of coral and they have to go back there because of their clientele, well, a very viable solution is to install mooring buoys. And what's been done in this case, you can see those two loops those are anchor mooring pins. So what, what's happened is that basalt boulder, not, that's not live coral, but you can see all the live coral all around it. Drill holes into the basalt, take these pins and cement them in place, and then lines would be attached to a float, which would be just under the surface so that you know, a boat wouldn't hit it or anything. But the, the operators would know the exact location of that buoy, could go back to it, send a diver over with a rope, swim under the, the buoy, attach it, and they're on there. They don't have to anchor. It's a very simple operation and provides essentially total protection of the coral around there. And these kinds of mooring buoys are being used more and more all over the world. Hawaii's got quite a number of them. It's not always you know, the ultimate solution to things because we know now and in some of the communities what they say is if you put a mooring buoy system in where there's not one now, what you do is you attract people to that area and they start using it. Okay, so some of the communities are worried that maybe there's not much use there now, but if they put a mooring buoy system in, all of a sudden you know, everybody's going to kind of jam on it. Uh, but in areas that are being used where people are anchoring, then it's kind of, you know, it's a no-brainer because if you don't install a mooring buoy, people are just going to anchor on the reef and you're going to end up with, with a decimated reef. And one of the things uh, that, you know, sort of the the doubting Thomases might say, well, you know, why worry about a little bit of anchoring damage? Why worry about snorkelers walking on a little coral head? Why worry about any of this minor stuff? Because every once in a while a storm comes to, to the islands and the destruction it causes is, you know, we're talking hundreds of thousands of times more significant than what divers or snorkelers or, or boaters are doing. Well, yeah, that certainly is the case. Uh, storms wreak havoc on the reef. This is an area, this is West Hawaii, uh, an area called Ke'e, during a 1980 storm, which was a 100-year storm, meaning that a storm of that magnitude occurs about once every 100 years. Much larger waves, 20-foot waves, were hitting Kona Coast, which, you know, doesn't get winter surf like that. Uh, it's larger than the Niki and any of the hurricanes that have passed. So, typically, this is what that area looks like. You know, Kona, it's just flat calm, it's in the lee, bang. But then all of a sudden, every so often, you get this monumental storm coming in with huge waves. And what you end up with are areas, this is the before, same area, Ka, beautiful coral areas, kind of going to drop off probably about uh, 40 feet. And then after that storm, that area was, was smashed. So someone would say, well, you know, look at all this damage here. Why worry about, you know, a few anchors or, you know, snorkels and things? Well, the point is there's so much damage caused by natural catastrophes, so to speak, that the areas that are in good, good stead, that are still healthy, that are protected, they're relatively small. And you have to actually exert more protection to them because otherwise you're going to end up, you know, in these areas. So it's not that you can just sort of disregard 
any kind of protection because Mother Nature is, you know, so much more destructive. No, 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 no. You've got to protect what is remaining. And that's, you know, the whole focus of, of you know, all the efforts about mooring buoys and, and education and so forth. But coral uh, is very vulnerable in Hawaii to large waves, particularly on leeward coasts, because they, they happen very irregularly. And when they do, as in this case of this 100-year storm, the damage is substantial and it lasts for a long time. Now, this area has actually grown back somewhat, but there are many other areas that almost 20 years later, it looks like the storm happened yesterday. So it's not something that repairs itself real quickly. It can go on for a generation or more uh, before it re rejuvenates. And that's true with, you know, anchoring damage as well. Okay, then the, the next aspect that I want to talk on uh, is something that we're beginning to focus a lot of attention to, and that's the aquarium, the tropical aquarium collecting industry and its impact on coral reefs. Uh, what you're seeing here is, is uh, an old picture, typically of the way aquarium collectors operate in Hawaii, where they'll set up a small mesh net barrier net, and that's that uh, kind of flimsy thing you see there, and then they will chase the fish into it and trap them with small hand nets and then put them in containers and uh, move them up. So let me just jump off of the slides, and I've got a couple of uh, Elmo pictures uh, that I'll show you, which will talk just to give you a little background on what the magnitude of, of the uh, aquarium industry is. So if you could uh, switch to Elmo, that would be great. Well, if you've been reading the, the newspapers for the last 20 years, you've probably seen various headlines uh, such as these. There's not much left at Mahu Kona, or tropical fish collecting must be banned now. Divers, collectors at odds over decline on Kona reefs, reef fishes. Fishes disappearing around the pier. Collectors, fishermen at odds over harvest and extinction year 2000. Well, these are things that have been bandied about in the newspapers uh, for over 20 years, focusing on aquarium reef fish collecting. And typically, it, it was recreational divers, tour boat operators who are all saying, you know, the aquarium reef fish collectors are out there raping the reef, decimating the fish stocks, and, and causing irreparable harm. Well, lots of observations. All kinds of people at public hearings would get up and say, you know, yeah, you know, this is, I go to my dive site and go back there now, and there's nothing left, and collectors are doing this, and collectors are doing that. Well, uh, unfortunately, there was never any hard evidence, no scientific evidence, to, you know, support claims one or the other, mainly because there were no scientists really looking at the question. Uh, there was never even a division of aquatic resources biology, biologist over in that side of the coast. So nobody really knew. There was a lot of allegations and actually, you know, escalated into violence and threats and so forth and so on. Uh, but things are changing. And um, part of the reason is because of UHH and DAR doing cooperative studies examining the question. Part of it is the fact that now there is a DAR uh, position over there. And, uh, you know, we can start to get into some of the questions uh, of what's going on. So what I'm going to show you here is just a, a graph giving you an idea of the change in the number of Big Island commercial aquarium permits. So if you, if you want to go out and make some money being an aquarium collector, you've got to get a commercial aquarium collecting permit, which costs zip. It's free. Anybody can get it. You have to have, in addition to that, a commercial fishing license. So you know, anybody who wants to sell fish or, or lobsters or whatever has to have a commercial fishing license. And that costs all of $25. So for $25, you can set yourself up with a couple of hand nets and a boat and go out and become a tropical reef fish collector. And we started back here in 76, and you can see there was a number of decline. But then from the early 80s, uh, a substantial increase. Uh, here we are in 99, somewhere west Hawaii now only, of you know, 40, 50, 60 commercial collectors working the West Hawaii coastline. Now, this is no doubt an underestimation because we know there are some of them that are out there that haven't even gotten the $25 commercial permits or haven't gotten the, the aquarium permit. So you know, even though it doesn't cost anything, there are some that don't bother. So you know, this is a kind of, of effort. We're talking you know, 50, 50, 60 uh, fishermen out along the West Hawaii coastline collecting about a hundred different kinds of animals, mainly fish, uh, 
but you know, invertebrates, some lobsters, crabs, uh, feather duster worms, but you know, primarily fish. And of that, of the fish, this guy here, so this is uh, various kinds of animals here, but this one particular species, zebra so Z flavescens, is the yellow tang. So the yellow tang, just that one species, constitutes more than half of what the collectors are catching. 57.4. This is 1994. I don't have the data more recent, but you know, it's something like that. So one species really makes up a lot of what's going on in the commercial uh, aquarium business. And you can see this is, in this graph here, this is just looking at the catch of, of the yellow tang from 1986 to 1994. And the bars represent the numbers that are caught. So it's starting down here in 1986 of about uh, less than 40,000, and now coming up to 1994, uh, almost 250,000. Okay, so you know, you can see the nice, significant increase. This line represents the price per fish in those in those years, the wholesale price that the fishermen would get. So you can see this is 1.9, so it's a little less than two dollars. Okay, so you go out and you catch a yellow tang. You know, so you got a dollar seventy-five. You bring that fish in alive. Okay, and we're talking you know two hundred thousand of them. So you know, it's a substantial amount of fish. It's a substantial amount of, of revenue. So yellow tang's going up. The number two species, which is collected, is a, a little golden eye cole. Um, and again, very similar pattern. Price going up, numbers going up. Again, f you know, kind of following the pattern of permits going up as well. Uh, not everybody, not every species, you know, shows that pattern. But uh, just to give you an example of one that doesn't, this is the number three species in terms of numbers caught. This is uh, Achilles tang or Pakuikui. And the numbers on that one kind of, you know, fluctuating. It's, they're not going up and up. You know, what this means, whether they're running out of them or not. You know, the price spiked uh, 93 and then started to go down. Uh, you know, it's hard to really interpret uh, what's going on here. The collectors are, are required on a monthly basis to file a report on how much they catch. But it's nobody checks on it. So you don't really know, you know whether they're being honest or they're inflating them or deflating them or whatever. But that's where these numbers and these graphs are based on actual reports that the collectors have been uh, turning in over the years. Some people say these are you know, totally underestimating the amount of fish that are being collected because the collectors uh, are trying to, you know, they don't want to report how much money they're making. They're not, you know, they don't want to be connected with uh, anything that the state is doing. So, you know, they just don't pay attention to it. So it's hard to assess the, re the reliability of the catch statistics. But looking at it all in general, okay, this is lumping those 100 and something species together from 76 to 94. You can see the catch is going up and up and up and up and up and up and up. Okay, and that's essentially the bone of contention is that the catches are so large now, and we're talking at least a quarter of a million fish uh, and invertebrates that they're impacting impacting the reef. Uh, slides, please. So just follow a little bit more on the, on the collectors themselves. So, you know, they'll, as I mentioned, they use a barrier net. They'll put it in a bucket, bring it up to the boat, bring it to their, you know, wholesale area, and then uh, market it from there. And typically, the equipment they would be using are, is the barrier net, which you see on the bottom, and then the hand net. So, you know, they drive them against the, hand, uh, against the barrier net, use the hand nets, and collect them. The industry in Hawaii is actually viewed from the most of the other parts of the world as the epitome of an ecologically sane collecting industry. You know, you've heard about cyanide collecting and you know, dynamite collecting in the Philippines and places like that. You know, very, very destructive practices. Conscientious collectors in Hawaii don't do that sort of thing. You know, they're very, very uh, adept at wielding their nets. In fact, some of them don't even use the barrier nets. They just use the hand nets and they kind of finesse uh, the fish that they're collecting. But it's, a very, it's also a very lucrative business. Uh, one of the collectors told me that anybody who's sort of worth their salt underwater, that's a decent co collector, should be making $45,000 a year. So, you know, there's a real strong motivation for people to just sort of get into it. All you need is a small boat, $25 permit, and you can go out, 
and start collecting a lot of fish. And some of them are not so scrupulous. You know, some of them are, are great businessmen, great environmentalists, and then others are not. And oftentimes, it only takes a few sort of rogue individuals to ruin the reputation of, of the majority. And, and in some cases, that seems to be what the situation is in West Hawaii with you know, just a few uh, uh, renegades, as they're called. Okay, I mentioned the top three species that were collected, in case you're not familiar with them, uh, being uh, land-based that you might be. Yellow tang, the golden eye cole, and Achilles tang. Okay. Now, one of the concerns, uh, let me rephrase that. Actually, uh, quite a number of the concerns involved with the aquarium industry beyond you know, the, the allegations that they're depleting the number of fish, it comes down to basically a conflict between users. Okay. One of the user groups are the people that go out and get fish to eat, you know, whether it's you know, the subsistence fishermen or just recreational fishermen, you know, the casual guy going out or girl going out on the weekend to get something to eat. Well, some of the fishes that people eat are also the ones that are collected by the aquarium industry. So, for example, this guy, Pakui Kui, it's an esteemed food fish, as well as the one before that, the kole. So there's an overlap now that uh, you know, the aquarium collectors are going out getting them when they're small, and then the people are saying, well, well, wait, you know, wait, 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 you're taking the food off of our table because we're going to eat those when they get big. And if you're collecting you know, 100,000 of them or 50,000 of them, and particularly if you're collecting in my backyard, you're taking the food off the table. So you know, that was one area of conflict that is very much is still in focus here about uh, the overlap of the aquarium use versus food use. Then the other aspect, which probably has generated more heat uh, than the food issue, is the fact that tour boat operators, in particular, you know, dive tour operators, they oftentimes, when, you know, they'll go back repeatedly to an area and they have certain fish in there that are kind of stars, you know, charismatic things, things that are unusual. An example being this Hawaiian turkey fish. You know, it's a poisonous fish, a little guy, but real beautiful. It's uncommon. You, know, you don't find it all over. But it's a kind of a fish that has a lot of charisma. People like to see them. You know, you know, don't get near it. It's kind of cool looking. It moves slowly. and it's, you know, it's an interesting fish. Now, they'll go back, and this fish will be resident in this area. And tour operators you know, go back and show it and show it and show it. If it gets collected out of that area, you know, it's like a major loss to that tour boat operator. And it's not just this one particular one, but you know, there are a number of species that are in this category. They're rare, they're cool, and when they get collected, and, and oftentimes the rare, cool ones have, you know, command a high price, so the collectors focus on them, creates turmoil. Another one is the banded angelfish. Uh, not an uncommon fish. It tends to be a little more deeper water, so when it comes up into shallow water, it's, you know, wow, that's a rare fish. So people, you know, jazz when they see this. Uh, so what we're talking now is a conflict between tour boat operators, tour dive operators, environmentalists, photographers, and the fish collectors. And that's a lot of people on one side. Um, and this guy in particular is sort of an indicator species of, of this conflict. This is Tinker's butterfly. This is a, a very rare species in Hawaii. It's a deep water fish. We're talking you know, down two, three, four hundred feet or so. But occasionally individuals would be found in the bottom range of, of scuba diving depths. And, and they're resident in an area. So again, when tour boat operators see them, you know, it's kind of cool. But this is probably one of the most expensive fish in the aquarium industry. Uh, if you go to a retail store to buy one of these for your fish tank, you're going to pay over $300. So there's a lot of motivation for a collector to go out and nail these things because they're going to get, you know, 75 or more for that one fish. So what's happened now is essentially they've become non-existent in diving depths. They're still present in way deep depths, and these guys, some of the collectors, literally risk life and limb to go down 240 feet or more because, you know, it's picking up a $75 bill down there. Uh, and, you know, they'll, they'll collect hundreds of these uh, in a year, making them unavailable to the tour boat operators. Okay, well, so what, you might say? Well, you know, the tour boat operator's got to suck wind on this one. Uh, well, if you start weighing the impacts of tour boats and, and, and tourism versus, you know, the economic impact of, of fish collecting the industry. I said uh, 
collectors, you know, the whole industry generates somewhere like eight hundred thousand, nine hundred thousand dollars a year. Well, the marine tourism industry generates almost a thousand times that. Okay, so you know the scales are like doom. And as a manager, okay, we're not just managing you know, the fish, what we're managing sometimes is to, to optimize the economic productivity of a resource. And in the case, in this case, if you're trying to maximize how much money can be generated by, say, you know, a tinker's butterfly, by someone coming and repeatedly looking at it versus someone to come and take it and, you know, put it off in an aquarium, you know, it's a thousand times greater to leave it alone and, you know, create a tourism industry based on, you know, the marine resources. So, Part of what we're doing is trying to maintain the integrity of the ecosystem to maintain rare species and have them available for people both to eat and to view and to make sure they're not just all you know, removed, particularly rare ones where they literally can remove all uh, by collectors. And then another concern beyond just you know, the, the money aspect of it is, well, what happens when you start taking certain species that are kind of key individuals out there? And what I'm looking at here is the Hawaiian cleaner wrasse, which is that small one that's behind the butterfly fish there. Now, I don't know if you know anything about, Hawaii, uh, about cleaner fishes. They actually remove dead tissue and parasites and so forth. And there's little stations where fish come in and pose for these fish, and the, fish, the little cleaner wrasse will come on and you know, do its, its job there. Well, we know in certain areas of the Pacific that these guys actually go out and eat a lot of parasites off fish. We don't have that evidence here in Hawaii so much, but we know that fish like to be around these cleaning stations, that there's an important ecological little concept going on out there. What we don't know is what happens when you start taking thousands of these cleaner wrasses off the reef every year. And this is a fish that is collected. It's, it's saleable and gets you know, a fairly decent price. So we don't know what the effect is. We don't anticipate it's going to be anything positive. You know, and removing this isn't going to improve things out there. So you know, there is concern for species that are key species beyond just being rare. And then, of course, when it comes to those knucklehead renegades that I was mentioning before, every once in a while they do something that is so stupid uh, that it just creates turmoil. And what this is a picture of is a dumpster in Kauai High where a collector for some reason, lost all of the good portion of his fish that day and just dumped them in the dumpster. And of course, you know, people come up and they oh, smell this stuff and then they see it and they go berserk. You know, here's, you know, raping the reef in its rawest form, you know, just collecting all these fish. And you can see those same butterfly fishes that was uh, in this picture there. So that's the ornate butterfly fish. And, and, and that's a species too. It's a, a species that feeds on coral. And it's very difficult for most aquarium owners to maintain in good condition fishes that have real weird diets or specialized diets. And it's hard to feed them live coral. So, you know, you can take a fish like this and have it in your aquarium, and unless you're a real expert and have live coral, it's just going to waste away and die, you know. So, yeah, the fish store op owner, you know, made some money on it, the you know, collector made money on it, but, you know, it's not a sustainable kind of uh, connection with the, the aquarist that's going to die. And, you know, as I said, this kind of thing is just so inflammatory. And it's been going on for years that it just has poisoned the public's attitude towards aquarium collecting. And it's generated, you know, just a lot of bad publicity for them. But what do we know scientifically? Okay, that's kind of, you know, the feel that people have and a lot of bad mouthing about it. But what do we know, you know, is it having an effect on population? So we've got two different approaches to, to look at this, one of which is going... If, if a study had been done in the past, a good study, to update it and see what has changed through time. Okay, so we've looked at two areas. One is uh, at Ka, that's the place where that, you know, all that storm surge came in. Uh, and another is at City Refuge. And in this bar graph, it's a little hard to show without being able to point at it. But if you look in the back, you see those two dark bars, right, sticking up. Okay, those are the numbers of fish recorded in transects uh, per 100 square meters 20 years ago. Okay, and then on one side, the left side, the taller one, is the, number, the top 10 most abundant fishes. Top 10 most abundant, the one to the right of that in the back, are the top 10 
aquarium species. Okay? So the other ones are just general species. The ones on the right are the aquarium species. And then you come closer, and the two bars below that in the front are what we're finding 20 years later. So you can see they've dropped. And, in, in, and particularly with regard to the aquarium collecting, it's down over 50%. Okay? So the number, if you were to go back you know, 20 years, you would find twice as many fish of aquarium kinds than you would by going out there today. So you know, it's like the first sort of concrete evidence that not only are they maybe removing rare species, but they're actually you know, just changing the whole ecosystem, depressing the numbers of fishes that they're collected. Because you can see that the uh, collected ones are much lower uh, the, uh, than the, just the general ones there. So that's in K. And this is just the, this is preliminary information. It's like the first of three years. Very similar pattern at Ho Now Now. Again, the back ones, the dark ones, 20 years ago, come up to the future, things are reduced, and particularly with aquarium collecting, again, over 50%. So, you know, cutting the number of fish in half, uh, uh, collected species, uh, in that 20 year period. And then another way to look at it was done by, again, Drs. Uh, Halliker and Tissot from UHH. And what they, they examined was, let's look at an area that's protected, like in a marine life conservation district or a fisheries management area, where there is no collecting. Let's look at a nearby area that's open to collectors. Okay, and they did it in two cases, uh, which was at Red Hill on the bottom, and then coming up to Old Cone Airport and Honokohau. The two on top were, were not followed up on. So they have these kind of paired. You know, collect in one, look at one that's not collected. Start coll in collecting information. See, over a two-year period, What's the difference in an area that's collected and worked by the collect aquarium collectors and an area that's not? And what they found, again, was, was uh, well, let me just uh, give you a little background on it. So they looked at a total of 21 different kinds of fish. And out of that 21, they targeted seven of them as being collected species. And then the rest were ones that weren't targeted by the collectors. So they wanted to see if there was any difference in these two groups, the ones that were collected versus the ones that were not collected. OK, you understand that? And the ones that they looked at were the ones I showed before, the yellow tang, the cole, the Achilles tang, and then this is potter's angel, long-nosed butterfly fish, or the forceps fish, the uh, orange spine surgeon fish, and Moorish idol. So these were the seven that they keyed in on as being you know, heavily collected, because we know based on the catch reports. So let's see what happens if we look at those versus the ones that are not collected in, in two kinds of areas, collected and non-collected. And I don't know if you can see it. I can't. But what they found is that out of six out of those seven species, there was a significant decline in the collected areas. And it ranged from something like 18% for the cole down to over 50%, almost six, over 60% in some of the others. Okay, so sort of similar numbers. We're talking about you know, overall about a 60% reduction in areas that are collected. And this is what people have been saying for 20 years or more, that the collectors are reducing the numbers of fish in the area. They're taking the rare ones and eliminating the, you know, the, the ones that are sort of the spectacular ones. So now we have you know, clear-cut scientific evidence that, yeah, you know, you go out and you collect intensively, you're going to reduce the populations. You know, it's, it seems obvious. Uh, you know, you take fish out, there's going to be fewer of them, right? But collectors have denied that uh, for years. They say, you know, you collect them out, and next year they're going to be all back in because all, you know, cakey are going to come in. So in some cases that is the case, but in many cases uh, they don't come back as quickly as people uh, had thought. Okay, just a couple, two other aspects that relate to collecting that uh, are very important. Uh, they're not you know, specifically collecting activities, but they're concepts that you need to uh, become familiar with. One is how old fish are, you know, small reef fish. You know, what are we talking about? Most people have no idea. Most scientists don't have any idea either. That's unfortunate. And it's only in the last few years that people have begun to look to say, well, how old are these little fish that people are starting to collect? So this one here is one of the fishes that someone's done some work on. This is Menpachi, or uu, uh, brick soldier fish. And what they found out with this guy when they aged him was that it lives to 14 years old, which is you know, fairly 
long for, for small fish. It only gets to be about eight inches. It lives to 14 years old, but doesn't actually become sexually mature until it's seven years old. So it's relatively slow growing and slow maturing. Okay, so seven years old for maturity and a lifespan of at least 14 years old. And then another one that, that's been looked at is the, uh, the little Decilis, which is a collected in the aquarium species. A little, you know, it's only a fish that gets about that big. And again, it has a lifespan of 11 years old and doesn't become sexually mature until it's at least six or six and a half years old. Now, if you look at a mahi-mahi, uh, or you know, tuna fishes and things, mahi-mahi in particular, well, those fish grow to maximum size you know, almost two years, they're full grown, and they may not last much longer than two years or three years. And they're sexually mature in their second year. So they're you know, growing fast, they become sexually mature, put a lot of eggs, and reproduce quickly. The reef fishes, at least the ones that we were starting to get information on, are not, they're kind of the opposite of that. You know, they, they're growing very slowly, they're living a long time, they're not becoming mature until they're relatively old. And probably, you know, their reproductive output over their lifespan is going to be much less than something that's, you know, just really growing and reproducing uh, rapidly. So the way we age things, just to, you know, give you an idea real quickly, is within the inner ear of fish, you know, they don't have external ears like we do, right? But they do have some of the bones that uh, are analogous and homologous to our bones. And they're like little BBs. And you can take these things out and you cut them in half and stain them properly, put them under a microscope, and what you see are rings, like a tree trunk. And if you, you sometimes you have to do some experimentation to make sure you're, you know, know what you're talking about. But once you establish that these are daily rings, in the case of this fish, this is Nehu, you can actually sit down and count 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, uh, 13 or so. So this is a, a, a larval Nehu, a little silvery fish, that's about 13 days old. And that's how they aged those two species that I mentioned before. That, you know, it's, of course, when the fish is 11 years old, there's a lot of rings to count. So you spend a lot of time. You get technicians to do that, count all those rings up. But you get a real good estimate uh, of the age of the fish. And the more we look into this, well, let me mention this too. So the fact that they're small and they mature late, you go out and you see a little coral head like this, and there's a bunch of little fish on it. Some of them may be mature, but there's a good chance that most of them probably aren't. So, you know, if you come in and take those fish, whether you're, you know, fishing or, or collecting whatever, you're taking a large portion of that reproductive population because you may think you're just collecting juveniles. And yet, you know, they're little guys, but they're immature. They've never reproduced, okay? So they're very vulnerable uh, to exploitation, the coral reef fish are, because of the slow growth and slow maturation. Now, there's another group of fish that have been examined and these are the surgeon fishes. And this is a kala, the, or blue-spined uh, unicorn fish, and then the orange bar surgeon fish. Well, what they're finding when they age these guys, their minimum lifespan is somewhere between 30 and 45 years. Okay, so people going out poking you know, fish this big, and it could be older than they are. Okay, so this isn't something, you know, that's happening, you know, there's lots of them occurring all the time. This is an old timer out there that you're, you're removing. So very, very long life for some of these fish that people didn't even dream of, that, you know, living 45 years. You know, they're not giant fish, you know, they're talking that big. So, again, this long lifespan and this, this characteristic of them makes them very vulnerable to, to being taken, whether it's by aquarium collectors or by food fishermen. And is probably part of the re reason that we see such, you know, declines in coral reef areas as soon as they start being exploited. You know, very quickly uh, the numbers seem to drop off and don't replenish themselves in many cases. And the last item that I want to talk about, this is a little blenny called a stout body blenny. You know, kind of a cool little guy, but you know, not that much interest. He's not a food fish or anything, but why he's on the screen is that he's one of the few species that someone has spent enough time studying so they can estimate what their reproductive output is. How many eggs are being put out? How many are coming back 
as juveniles. Okay, so we're talking about the replacement rate. You know, you can take fish, 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 if fish keep coming back. But if you keep taking fish and none come back, well, what happens? Boom, you know, the stock crashes. So that's the key to it all. And that, and that process of fish coming back is called recruitment. And it's just a scientific jargon word. What they're talking about is our fish coming out of this life phase, which has them off of the reefs. And it's characteristic of almost all tropical reef fish where they'll spawn, lay their eggs either on the reef or, or over the reef. The eggs are fertilized. They drift off the reef. They mature out literally in the open ocean for weeks to months. And somehow, if they're fortunate, depending on currents and things, they'll be moved back in over the reef. And at that point, if they mature, then they'll settle out and become babies on the reef and, and you know, begin their, their uh, stay on the reef. Apparently, uh, you know, it's a difficult process. Let's go back to, there he is. So what, what's going on here, and it's a little bit hard to see, this is the male of this um, stout-bodied blenny. The female lays the eggs on the bottom, and then the male comes along and he fertilizes them, and then he hangs out and protects the nest. And see that kind of yellow golden stuff? That's actually the eggs. And if it was a, a, you had a good view of the slide, you see there's actually three colors of those eggs in there because the female will lay one clutch, the male fertilizes it, then the next day lay another color, another clutch, and then a third day or a fourth day. So subsequent clutches of eggs, and the eggs are starting to develop. And as they develop, the yellow, which is the yolk in the egg, gets used up and starts to turn into little larval fish in there and starts to look silvery like little baby fish. But anyhow, the point of it all is that one guy, a very dedicated graduate student by the name of Bruce Carlson, who's now the head of the Waikiki Aquarium, in Hanama Bay, he set up a study area, uh, a couple hundred square meters. And he had 30 males and 30 females. Now, these guys don't move around much in this area. You know, they kind of stay in the small part of the reef. And he would go out, and each time a nest was made, he would go out and count the number of eggs. Not individually. You know, you, you, you sample. You take a section of it and count there, and then you estimate the size. And you could come up within the course of a year how many fertilized eggs are being produced by these 30 females and 30 males. So what he found is that in the course of a year, this little family of fish there, so to speak, could produce, or did produce, over 6 million eggs. Okay? A lot of eggs. Not a single juvenile fish recruited to his study area. And this is where they lived. So 6 million eggs produced, but not a single one made it back. So it's, the point is that it's very difficult in many cases for many species to get large numbers of individuals every year to come back and replace you know, adults that are dying either naturally or by fishing. So this is one of the few cases where someone's actually had the numbers. Uh, so 6 million, what's the return? Zero. So if you were to collect all 60 of those fish there, the next year there wouldn't have been any there in case, you know, unless an adult moved in there. And you know, why that is, Part of the thinking is has to do. Can we? Here we go. Has to do with our location. You know, again, as I said in the beginning, we're this very, very isolated reef area, surrounded by thousands and thousands of square miles of open ocean. If larvae, eggs, fertilized eggs drift off, we're talking, you know, five, six, eight, ten miles offshore. Who knows whether they're going to get back? So our isolation again makes things very difficult for many, many species of fish to sustain population, makes them very vulnerable to exploitation. And again, uh, you know, the bottom line being, got to be careful what you're doing, uh, both you know, when it comes down to something as mundane as anchoring and uh, you know, realize that uh, our, fishes, our fisheries are much more vulnerable than many other fisheries uh, in the world. So that's it. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, Bill. Um, maybe you can take a seat sure. over there, and then we'll open it up to questions. Um, <clears throat> we've come to that portion of the class where those of you in the viewing audience, and of course those of you here in the studios, can uh, call in questions. Uh, the numbers will be on the screen. The numbers are 
7727-974-7726. And uh, for those of you on the Outer Islands, you can call us, uh, collect at 961-9046. And of course, for those of you who just joined us, you're watching Agriculture 194R, Focus on Agriculture. And we are coming to you live this evening, so uh, we're featuring this evening Dr. Bill Walsh, aquatic uh, biologist uh, uh, with the uh, Division of Aquatic Resources, Department of Land and Natural Resources here in uh, Hawaii. And uh, he is in Kona, and uh, we do have a caller, so will the first caller let us know where you're calling from and go ahead with the question, please. Uh, yes, my name is Tony. I'm calling from South Kohala. Uh, can you speak up a little louder, please? Yes, my name's Tony. Yes. I'm calling from South Kohala, from okay. the Waikoloa area. Uh-huh. Uh, we have quite a problem here with the uh, tropical fish collectors. Um, what is the chance that, number one, the bill's going to be passed, and number two is, um, the second question is, when do you think, or possibly when could these fish resources be replenished because we're missing between 90 and 95 percent of our fish stocks right now. Okay, uh, Bill, why don't you go ahead and answer. You uh, mentioned, so uh, let me just, for the audience's sake, last year there was a bill called Act 306 which was passed, became Law 306 or Act 306 which mandated that third, at minimum of 30% of the West Hawaii coastline should be set aside in no collecting areas, okay? So a group of West Hawaii residents was called together, formed the West Hawaii Fisheries Council to actually work out the details of these areas. And, and I believe next week uh, that management act action will be explored in detail. So just to, to uh, give you an update on where that stands now. It's in the governor's office. We're waiting for approval to hold the public hearing, which is sort of the last phase before uh, it goes back to the Board of Land and Natural Resources. Probably a good time, if you're feeling that things are lagging, to maybe uh, give the governor uh, a jingle or two. He was just awarded uh, a, or made a presentation by the Secretary of the Interior, if I, if I remember correctly, yesterday for his work in coral reef uh, areas. And I know he has a lot of interest in, in that particular uh, aspect. So it's sort of waiting there. As soon as we hear, we'll set a public hearing date. We have to have 30 days notification. And at that point, we hope, uh, because of all the work that the West Hawaii Fisheries Council has done, that we'll move rel relatively quickly to establishing those fishery reserves area. And you know, there's a large one up in North Kohala that covers uh, from Puako South all the way down to Hanaiho Malu Bay. So all of that area will be off limits. In terms of your, your second part of you know, replacement, uh, replenishment, as I alluded to in the talk, it really depends on what species you're talking about. You know, the rare, uncommon species, they have low recruitment rates. You can be talking many years for some of those species to, to reestablish themselves. Uh, some of the more common ones, uh, yellow tangs and coles, probably they'll rebound relatively quickly. And certainly if, there, if it's a reserve that's in, in good stead and protected, uh, the numbers will rapidly accumulate. So, uh, you know, three, four, five years, things will just get better and better in those areas. So, well, one last question. Yep. Um, say these tropical fish collectors are endangering our reefs to the point that they're dropping anchor within restricted boundaries from... The mooring sites, I know the mooring restriction is uh, dropping an anchor within 100 yards of the mooring, such like that. I'm a dive instructor and a captain, a Coast Guard captain on this coast. Um, other than DLNR and reporting it through the lack of, of monetary situation that we have, there's no enforcement really going on. Is there anything I can do to push these guys an area that they're able to collect to or anything like that? Uh, that sort of, you know, citizen uh, activism is, is kind of slippery ground. Uh, it's very slippery ground. Very we're, slippery. we're fighting day like it's a war. This is Bosnia almost. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I think the first line of defense, if you will, is to when you see transgressions like this, 
is to make sure you notify DOCARE, which is you know the Conservation and Resource Enforcement Correct. Branch, yeah. and because they'll you know, they'll follow up on these things, and you know we now have an agent who has been assigned to this issue. They call it the Magnet Officer Program, and that's Scott Sherrill Amba, who has his office up in, in Captain Cook, right. and you know this guy is on it, and DAR actually will be running some joint missions with DOCARE, you know just to to increase their ability to increase our effectiveness and you know in terms of our management activities so you know they they have a new attitude they definitely want to be out enforcing and they need to get information and you know if you talk to them they'll tell you how you can actually create a case against somebody that's doing so, violating uh, you know a law that'll hold up in court without you know physically confronting anybody you don't want to do that you know it, it can be life threatening right it's gone person. beyond that already though yeah so what I would suggest is, you know, when you see something that, like this, document it, call DoCare. They've got forms that you can fill out and, you know, work through that system. And, uh, you know, they have said, we're going to clamp on this. So it's coming. You know, those areas are not off limits to collectors now. Uh, so they have a right to be there. And in areas where they, you know, will legally be permitted to, to collect, they will collect. They're not supposed to be damaging coral, you know, by anchoring. That's a little harder to, you know, to really make a case out of unless you actually, you know, get underwater and, and, and see what's going on there. Right. Uh, so uh, when you see something that's, you know, kind of an outstanding violation, get on the horn. Call, call Don't Care. Uh, you said Coast Guard. Uh, one of the areas that we're working, too, is involving the Coast Guard Auxiliary because the, the, the active Coast Guard is very much involved now in resource enforcement. Resource management. Right, and we're making uh, inroads with the local uh, Kona auxiliary to have them you know, be eyes and ears uh, for enforcement too. So that's something that uh, will again magnify the efforts of uh, the doe care officers. I appreciate your Thanks. time. Well, thank you very much for calling from South Kohala. We have two additional callers. Will the next caller let us know where you're calling from and go ahead with the question, please. I'm calling from Hilo. Yes. This seems like a great opportunity for somebody to go into business of raising tropical fish. Now, what's been done in that area? Okay. Uh, that's, you've got it. That's an excellent point. And um, there, things are moving in that direction. In fact, at Kale Holy Point, there's somebody not so much raising fish, but he's raising giant clams. Tridacna clams, which we don't have in Hawaii, but you know are found in other parts of the world, which were being taken for the aquarium trade. So now this this uh, scientist is raising them, and he has a great business, you know, selling baby giant clams, if you will. And someone is uh, starting uh, soon to start raising seahorses, which are used not only in the aquarium industry, but uh, you know, sold as aphrodisiacs and so forth and so on. So hey, that's a good market too. Part of the problem with a lot of the aquaculture of you know, the fish that we have on reefs or, or tropicals in general is that very little is known about their reproduction. Uh, we don't know, you know how to get them to spawn yet. We don't know how to sustain the larvae when you do. So there's a lot of basic research that needs to be done. Some of which, you know, like places like Oceanic Institute have been working on mullet and you know, some more commercially important food fish. So there's a lot of supportive work. but it, it's only recent, recently that it's been looked at, you know, in terms of tropical aquarium fish. A couple of notable successes, though. A little uh, anemone fish is done successfully in a number of places uh, all over the world now, and it's one that they have the biology worked out very quickly and clearly, and you know, they basically don't have to uh, harvest in many places from the wild. And that's what's, you know, that's what's going to be. That's the wave of the future, because then you're not impacting the reef like that. And in fact, in many cases. You might be able to actually, you know, reestablish populations if you can you know, raise them commercially. So yeah, you, you got your finger on what what should be done. Yeah, that would take uh, the pressure off the yep. natural situation, exactly. right? Exactly. Thank you. Thank okay. You. Well, thank you for calling from Hilo. We have another caller. Uh, could you let us know where you're calling from and go ahead with question for Bill? Uh, aloha, Jack. This is uh, Forrest calling from Makalau on Maui. Okay. Uh, so, Bill. Um, what percentage of the fish that are currently being collected um, are native Hawaiian, and like what percentage are alien or introduced? Bill? Well, I think mo you could almost say almost entirely uh, all of the fish that are being collected for the, within the aquarium industry are native. Uh, some of them are endemic, found only here in Hawaii. 
really the only fish that you know, are introduced that are in any great numbers out on the reef that would be collected are Ta'ape and Roy. And those are collected in very small numbers. I think part of the reason is because they're predators. And you, know, you get them in the tank when they're small, they're both very beautiful fish. Uh, and they'd be great to keep by themselves, or with Ta'ape you could have a small school of them. But uh, sooner or later, you know, they, they get to be fairly good size. And if you've got small invertebrates or you've got other uh, small fish in there, they're not going to be around too long because they are predators. So yeah, unfortunately, uh, those species, which could probably stand some collecting, uh, aren't collected in any great numbers. And I got one more question. Um, what other animals other than fish are being collected? Uh, feather duster worms, some shrimp, uh, there's probably some crabs, I think some of the small ornamental lobsters, you know, things of that sort. Fish, again, uh, are the, the bulk, particularly on this island. When you get to, like, Oahu, which has a lot more mud bottom, uh, feather duster worms actually is the number one collected animal over there, if I recall. Is it occurring on Maui? Collecting? Yeah. Yeah, there's some collecting, although I don't know how many permits are uh, issued on Maui at the moment. Uh, curiously, one of the concerns about aquarium collectors that's being voiced by uh, people over there, it's not you know, individual entrepreneur collectors out there, but it's the uh, Maui Ocean Center that's collecting to stock their tanks over there. And they're kind of you know, losing a little bit of communication with, with some of the local people and just going out collecting and, and uh, you know, it's a public institution. Yeah, I noticed that too. Yeah, but uh, so that's a bit of a problem too. All right. Well, thank you very much and uh, keep up the good work. Thanks. Thank you for calling from Makawa on Maui. Uh, we have another caller. Uh, could you let us know where you're calling from and go ahead with the question, please? Uh, yeah, my name is uh, Jack Lovell and right. I'm calling from the Big Island. Okay. Uh, I've been over here for about 20 years now mm -hmm. and I've seen populations fluctuate up and down consistently over the years. Uh, one of the things I have seen is we have a, had an explosion of Tawapi and Roy out on the reef right now mainly because of everyone's afraid of eating them because of Cicatera. These guys do eat tropical fish. They eat them left and right all the time. Uh, not to mention uh, we have probably twice the population here that we did uh, 20 years ago. There's other th reasons why these fish are declining besides just tropical fishermen. And tropical fishermen are a very, very small group, but they're being made out to be the scapegoat of why we're seeing depletion. It's not all their fault. And we need to look at some of these other areas that, uh, and take responsibility for it. It's easy to point a finger and say, well, they're the ones that are the problem. Let's get rid of them. But that's not the case. And another thing, the dive charter operators, if you drop 100 people onto the reef on one spot, the fish are going to leave. If you have 100 people coming through your living room, you're going to move. And that's one of the things that uh, these guys don't recognize is the fact that everyone has an impact on the reef. Okay, and do you have a question? Uh, yeah, I would like to know uh, what kind of uh, steps they've taken to actually ascertain the impact of the toppy and the roy on the reef. Because like, right now I feel that those are the biggest impact on the reef right now. Okay, Bill? Yeah. How are you doing, Jack? Uh, yeah, no doubt uh, toppy and roy are, are having an impact. It's not quantifiable at this point. There is a study underway that's looking at the effect of Ta'ape, but it's not going to be on the inshore. They're looking at the effect on basically deep water, uh, you know, bottom fish and so forth. The thing to keep in mind, I think, with, with both Ta'ape and Roy, you know, you take the assumption that they are having an impact, is that if that is the case, what that means is that they are reducing the number of fish that are available for, you know, subsistence fishing, for recreational fishing, for collectors. So if you view it as sort of a you know, plague in that sense, it's depressing the numbers of fish, which means that the numbers available are less. But when you look at the catch statistics, the numbers of permits, the numbers that are being collected, you know, it just keeps going up and up. So yeah, you know, they may be a problem. But nevertheless, the response by the people that are using fish, taking fish, has to be modified to realize that there are fewer available fish. Now, let me make a point about Ta'ape, too. Tapi is a nocturnal uh, fish feeder. It also feeds on crabs. Uh, its primary impact, it feeds on sand flats. It aggregates in you know, relatively uh, sort of inactive groups during the day. You know, no one's really looked in detail at uh, 
gut studies in the last 15 years. The one study that did look at the impact of tilapia, you know, they didn't find large numbers of reef fish in there at all. What they found were things like menpachi, they found some goatfish, which, you know, some of those small guys are nocturnal feeders, and crabs, which again, all pointing to nocturnal feeding activity. And, and the genus Casmira, the tilapia, there are gut studies from other parts of the world where, you know, it's found throughout the Pacific. Again, indicating diurnal activity, inactivity, nocturnal feeding. So, you know, looking at their size range and the kinds of prey they would be taking, yeah, you know, no doubt, opportunistically, they may be taking, you know, occasional uh, daytime juveniles and so forth. But their main dietary atoms are not going to be tropical reef fish. And they're going to be, yeah. they're going to be smaller nocturnal kinds of creatures, particularly crabs. Uh, Kona crab, you know, that looks like one that's you know, going to chow down and, and evidence is coming out on that. Tape, I mean, Roy, he's a diurnal predator for sure. Uh, and we have, there's no studies done anywhere on Roy, any place in the world. So we don't have a feel. DAR is, is starting to focus attention on that because we want to know, you know, what kinds of things they're doing. And we need to know what? how much, you know, they're feeding. If we know that they're taking, for example, yellow it's tank, rambling. but we need to know what their rate is of taking is, and then you can factor that into uh, of things. It's bullshitting now. Right. Go on. And as you mentioned, the, the other stuff too, you know, about the anchoring, you know, as I said, uh, yeah, there's lots of impacts, storm impacts, but the bottom line is, regardless of the impact, if the, the effort of, of exploitation does not reflect decreased abundance, then you're going to get into problems. So when you see a study like UHH did with DAR, sure. that you know, there's, they had these species, the collected group versus the non-collected group, both had, were subject to Ta'ape, both were subject to Roy. So that, that's a constant throughout. And nevertheless, in the collected group, you see significant and substantial decreases. In the non-collected group, you don't. So that's a study that controls for that kind of effect. Okay, you know? Hey, does that answer the question from the Big Island? Uh, just one other one, one other question I had. Um, actually, it's two questions. One, um, in the study that you did, also there were decreases in fish that were non-collected in the study areas. Fish that were not collected were, I mean, the numbers were down. And the fish replenishment areas that are set aside now for supposedly to replenish these fish that are coming back that fish collecting will not be allowed in, um, you could still go in and spear these fish. You can still go in and net these fish. You can still take these fish out as long as they're dead. You just can't take them out if they're alive. Well, if you have a fish replenishment area, that doesn't do a lot of good if you can still take the fish out dead, but you can't take them out alive. It doesn't do any good. It's a joke. It's a total joke. And that's what's set up right now. So what this is is totally a user conflict issue right now, and it's taking out fish collectors, for the benefit of the dive charter industry, and it's got nothing to do with fish replenishment. Okay, uh, to respond to your first part about uh, what was the first, what was the first part again? Oh darn! Um, oh yes, yeah. Okay, they studied 20, the UHH study studied twenty one species, uh, seven collected species, fourteen non collected species. None of those fourteen non collected species showed a significant decrease versus, you know, collected versus uncollected. None of them did. Whereas six out of the seven collected species showed a substantial and significant decrease. So, you know, there's something very different between those two groups. Um, you know, getting back to, you know, the focus of fish replenishment areas. Yeah, you're right. You know, as, as that is now, the first step in these fish replenishment areas is focused on the activities of commercial aquarium collecting. And it's, it's not sufficient unto itself, and it's kind of a structural framework to hopefully get some other more uh, comprehensive kinds of management, dealing with gill nets and spear fishing and you know, other kinds of, uh, of fishing activities, because it's not just aquarium fishes that people are saying are decreasing. You know, it's other fishes that are not collected, uh, parrotfish and things that are you know, subject to, to fishing activity. So it's only step one in a much more comprehensive management plan. And the other thing, you know, as I mentioned before about uh, you, you know, you say collectors are being are picked on. Well, they're being focused on because it is one of the largest commercial uh, fisheries that we have in the state, in West Hawaii, certainly. Uh, they're, they're focused on pre-reproductive fishes, which is, you know, like the classic boo-boo when it comes to fisheries management. You want to make sure that fish grow 
to the point where they at least reproduce once. And this is a fishery that's specifically focused on fishes that never have a chance, by and large, to reproduce. And then secondly, that, or thirdly, the aspect I said of you know, managing, we're not managing just for the species. You know? In a classic fishery situation, a fisheries manager would say, my objective is maybe to optimize the output or the, the take from the fish to make sure that they don't become commercially non-viable. It's not that simple with this because there's other competing, as you noticed, other competing users. And as I pointed out, when you start you know, factoring in things like the you know, optimal economic productivity of a fishery, you know, you're against an, another activity, activity that has a thousand times the clout that you do. So you know, it's not surprising. Yeah, and you know, you're the focus of it. And it's, you know, from your perspective, it's obviously unfortunate. But you shouldn't be surprised uh, that so much focus uh, initially is being directed at you know, that sector. OK, well, thank you, Bill, for that answer. And uh, we have three callers. So, excuse me. So will the first caller let us know where you're calling from? And go ahead with the question, please. Hi, my name is Jonathan, and I'm calling from the Big Island. And okay. uh, my question for uh, uh, yeah. Bill is, um, what global changes um, that have occurred uh, as a result of El Nino and La Nina and uh, in the international year of the coral reef. And what effect will this have on uh, the deep water and uh, the reef fishes in Hawaii? OK, uh, Bill, maybe you can talk about the reef fishes. We'll talk yeah, about I'll, I'll sort of have to restrict later. to the reef fishes. Uh, the general consensus uh, is that our location is maybe fortuitously a bit removed from really the impact areas of, of both El Nino and La Nina in terms of resources. Uh, you know, you don't see the kinds of things that you do in the Galapagos where, you know, just totally severe drought, uh, influx of, you know, totally different water masses, radically different temperatures, and literally changing ecosystems both on land and in the ocean. Uh, you know, we have maybe some more subtle effects. Uh, one of the things that we observed this year, there was a relatively late recruitment period. Uh, the summer of spawning or summer of recruitment period seemed to extend into periods which typically would be very, very low periods of recruitment. So we're talking October and November. So uh, you know, whether that was related or not, we don't know. Uh, there were some reports of water temperatures being you know, several three degrees lower um, at one point. But you know, they're kind of subtle. And there's nothing dramatically apparent that uh, we've, uh, has been able to you know, kind of jump right out from both El Nino and we're just entering uh, La Nina. And I don't know if really anybody says there's anything going on with La Nina other than Bad drought in South Kona. OK, okay uh, Bill, uh, last year uh, the Navy was here, and um, they were conducting some low-frequency testing. Uh, there were fishermen in the area off the Kona coastline that dramatic, were dramatically affected by this. Uh, do you have any information on that? Like, were the fish, in fact, uh, affected by this testing? Yeah, I have zero on that. OK, la uh, one more. Uh, do you know anything about Maui Nui? I understand the islands of Maui, Molokai, Lanai, and Kaho'olawe at one time were a single island, but uh, through certain uh, geo, uh, geoclimate conditions occurring, uh, the island sank, and we were left with now four separate islands. Okay. Can you speak on that a little bit? Only if you can connect it with reef fish. Uh, well, <laughs> oh, well, obviously there, there must have been a reef there, and it sunk. I mean, is, do we have any evidence of that, or do you know any? Well, can, you know, you, can, I, you, can you put me on to anyone who could give me more info on that? Uh, well, you can call the geology department, I think. Uh, but then, you know, you realize that there are evolutionary processes going along in the islands here. We have you know reefs that are millions and millions, 24 million years or so, that are remnant fossil reefs. You know, as you head up into the Leeward Islands, uh, those become older and older. Uh, sunken reefs that at one time were emergent and were big island land masses that we know about. Uh, so. Yeah, uh, you know, I don't really know what to say other than kind of direct you to uh, the geologists who would probably give you the whole little scenario about that. Uh, the Big Island itself, you know, that uh, East Rift Zone is a uh, focal point for major geologic change sometime. And uh, when that goes, they're, you know, they're talking thousand foot tsunamis. So uh, don't hold your breath on that one, though. So. Yeah, uh, one, land, one last hi. question, Bill. Um, I know in uh, recording the age of whales, um, a wax plug is extracted from the ear canal and sliced in half, and then the rings are counted. 
can you give me the names of, or the name of the bones of the fish that are? Uh, I, I caught just the uh, last part of that segment on uh, aging, and uh, you mentioned something about there were bones that you would slice and then count the, or die and then count the rings. Right. The, the, the one that's used a lot is called the sagittive, okay? Uh, could you say that again? I'm sorry, I missed it. Uh, S-A-G-G-I-T-A-E. Okay. Okay. There's three of them in there, but uh, they found, and they vary in size, and sometimes, you know, different species, a certain one would be a little more suitable than the other, but, uh, you know, they're, they're kind of small things, and uh, it's sort of specialized. Uh, it's not the kind of thing you could do at home, uh, because you have to stain uh, selectively what the rings are, are alternating rings of crystal uh, deposit, crystalline structure, and a protein. And they're, at least in many of the tropical fish, are laid down on a daily basis of crystal, protein, crystal, protein, crystal, protein. And all, additionally, behind just raw aging, when there's changes in, the, in the, either the condition of the fish, like if it reaches sexual maturity, or it goes through transition of starvation, or you know, things of that sort, uh, in many cases, you can actually de detect these changes looking at the, um, the otolith pattern in that because it, it changes from its normal daily pattern. Thanks a lot, buddy. Hey. Mahalo. Thank You're you welcome. for calling from the Big Island. I think we have time for another call. Uh, will the next caller uh, let us know where you're calling from and go ahead with a question for Bill. Hi, Bill. It's Greg from Maui. Okay. The question I have is the... Uh, regulatory management issue is, aren't these fish collecting permits entirely discretionary? And if they are, why does DLNR keep issuing them? Bill? Uh, well, you know, the reality of the situation, yeah, is probably, it is discretionary. You know, you are required to have a small mesh net commercial aquarium permit. Whether, you know, it's anyone's ever been checked to see whether they, they do, in fact, I couldn't say. Uh, you know, as I say, things are changing. I've been on board a year, and uh, it's not going to be too long before we start making sure that everybody that's working uh, west of Hawaii waters is licensed, has a commercial permit, has a valid collecting permit. So, you know, I think there's been a laissez-faire attitude towards that, and, uh, but it, the, the framework is there to make sure that, uh, you know, those permits are, are in fact in force. And there's probably sometime in the future uh, going to be a move to made to, to you know, limit them, not only to cut back on the numbers of, of, of fishermen out there, but to sort of provide some stability to the industry. You know, the state is actually committed to maintaining a viable aquarium fish industry. It's also committed to, you know, reducing conflicts over use of, of, of the resources Bill, that they're I'm accessing. I'm going to have to cut you off. Uh, we've uh, run uh, <coughs> that portion of the class where we've run out of time. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank uh, Dr. Bill Walsh for joining us and for all the callers who have called in uh, and uh, uh, shared their uh, question with Bill. Uh, next Thursday evening, we're going to have uh, Pat Hendricks uh, here. He's an information specialist with the uh, Aquatic Resource uh, Division of the Department of Land and Natural Resources. And uh, he will be discussing uh, the uh, the management of coral reefs. So some of those questions regarding the management aspects of the coral reef will be discussed next Thursday evening. So this is Jack for GE saying thank you for watching and we hope that you'll watch us next Thursday evening and uh, we hope that uh, you have a good evening. This is Jack for GE saying good night.